just go ahead and stay here until till Bill's, till Alan comes up. <coughs> so Bill, what was it like being on the client side of, of practice? Yeah, well, I, I think I lived in a different world uh, <laughs> than uh, Sarah in the breath house. Uh, when I joined Xerox, and I won't bore you with that, but it was a fast-growing organization. Our sales school was at the Sheraton Hotel, Fort Lauderdale, on the beach. And we flew first class, and we shot craps for our budget. And I was really the first one in our family to go to work for a business, and I thought, wow, have we missed it. I mean, this is terrific. And so I, uh, you know, was, I did that for a number of years, and then in the mid-70s, we got a call on a Friday afternoon, I always remember it, and it said, on Monday, you ought to report to corporate, and you are now in charge of sales and marketing education. So I said, wow, have I screwed up. What happened to me? And we showed up on Monday. I showed up, and then two other men showed up, Ken Hansen from Field Services and a guy by the name of Frank Smith, who was a management specialist, and we sat there and waited for somebody to come. No one came. We waited on Monday on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and on Thursday, I said, you know, I think we've got a problem here. <laughs> there is nobody else here except us. And so I called my boss, who had never shown up, and he didn't answer, so we called his boss. And we said, you know, we're here, we know it's a two-year assignment, should we just stay here for two years, or you want us to do something? He said, oh, I forgot to tell you that your boss has been reassigned, and you guys have to figure out what to do. So he sent us to Penn State for two weeks, which was quite different than going to Fort Lauderdale for two weeks, because they ex expected you to work, much to the surprise of all three of us. And one of the articles that we read was written by Gary Rumler. And I looked at that and said, it kind of makes sense. So I discussed it with my two colleagues. They said, yeah, but he's an engineer. Now, you know, in a, I mean, I was at Xerox seven years before I knew we had an engineering or a manufacturing department, because <laughs> it wasn't important to me. So um, we invited Gary in, and, and of course, he drew his stick figures, boxes, circles, and Ken said, we're panning what to draw stick people? Because, you know, after all, all of our clients were in three-piece suits. I mean, it was very sophisticated. And, and so he actually developed a picture of Xerox Corporation, which had never been done before, because none of us actually knew there was engineering and manufacturing, and he kind of brought that to the floor. And so he actually showed us how these things got integrated and showed us where they were. I had never been to Webster, New York, where the R&D center was in manufacturing. I'd been to Rochester, but I didn't know they had a suburb called Webster. And my goal was never to go to Rochester, uh, stay in Stanford. So he, he helped put that together. But I realized that I couldn't take an engineer into a sales marketing type organization. I mean, it just wouldn't fit. The other thing is I assumed that he was old because he had gray hair by that time. And regrettably, he assumed I was old and wisdom because I had great hair. Turned out neither one of us really had that much practical experience, even though he had a great theoretical base. And so we decided that we would take one of the senior Xerox executives to Morristown for one of those stimulating three-day workshops. The man I took was a, a graduate of the Latin School in Boston, graduate of Harvard, actually wrote part of his business plan in Latin just to let us know that he was smart. <laughs> but I figured if I could get him to, to believe this, we would have a prayer of changing the way we develop managers, especially at the branch level, and some of our uh, future leaders. And so we went to Morristown for a great uh, session in, I think, December or January. And it was really, for us salespeople, not overly stimulating, plowing through chart by chart these binders, which I thought were great bookends. But, we, <laughs> but about 3 o'clock on Friday, it started to snow. And it snowed, and it snowed, and it was really clear we weren't going to get out, get out. And about that time, Gary's partner, Tom Gilbert, started to drink. <laughs> and those of you that remember Gilbert, he had a terrible chronic back problem, and he would tip a few. Well, he started about 3 o'clock on Friday, and the snow kept coming down, and we were there saying, you know, how are we going to get out? And all of a sudden, Gilbert, who is not able to stand up anymore, lays down on the main conference table 
Well, my Xerox executive's mouth kind of drops, and Gary says nothing. I mean, I am looking at him like, you better have a job for me, because my career is over. <laughs> and Gilbert started to speak. And all of a sudden, we're all standing around the table taking notes, <laughs> because we realized it was Gilbert's next book. <laughs> And it was great and was much better than the other two and a half days, <laughs> sober, that we had all gone through together. And at the end, Gary just said, let's talk tomorrow morning. Because no one was coherent to talk on Friday night. So Saturday morning, we, we sat down and he said, did you get it? And I said, not only did I get it, but the other executive got it. And you guys delivered and we could now go back and we began then to try and look at the organization really as an integrated system with people who did not want to look at it that way. And it, as the glory year started to end, it was, became very, very important. But I always, like, I looked at the bar back there and I thought it was a very appropriate uh, prop for the end and I volunteered to lay down, have a few, and explain the next theory. After the transition from Praxis came the Rumler Group, and about that time, I had uh, moved on and had uh, gone to Motorola at the request of the uh, chairman to uh, start an education institution, which eventually became Motorola University. And after I was there for a while, I realized it was time to bring Gary in because he was an engineer speaking to all engineers. I mean, there were, I mean, as one person said, we never had a vice president of marketing because we never found a person with a golf handicap low enough. Uh, at that time, they had 40 vice presidents of engineering and zero vice presidents of marketing. So I was the person on the new planet, and Gary was at home. And so we brought him in, and he began to assist us. He helped us design, along with Ray and others, a plan for the Motorola University uh, system over time. He also de developed a plan and began the tutorial of 27 people to understand what a performance-driven organization would look like and why we wouldn't be a traditional training organization. He helped create probably one of our most successful change programs called the Motorola Manufacturing Institute, which eventually became the Motorola Management Institute, which literally you could document and Al would speak to some of it, savings of millions and millions of dollars. And also the realization that we didn't really know how the business fit together. Again, Al talk about, but that was a big aha. And then he also coached, we would rotate people in, just as we did at uh, Xerox, and he really became the coach of the manufacturing manager who became his friend for the next 20-some years, Paul Heidenreich. But Paul was this manufacturing wild guy that was assigned to me. I mean, he's so wild, he lived in Scottsdale, Arizona. He had a sailboat, and he sat, on his, you know, sat in the sailboat every Friday night having cocktails, wishing the water would find him. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, you know, we gave Gary some really raw material that he did quite well with. He uh, helped us develop the excellence. So, and one of the things I really loved about Gary, and it's already been spoken, is he learned while he gave. And of all the consultants we've worked with over the last 30-some years, there are less than a handful that learned and would share things that didn't work with you as well as things that worked. And we, uh, eventually, this was beginning to spread, so we were invited to run a three-hour program for the CEO and the COO and the vice chairman. And I said, Gary, this really has to be great, because if it's not, you know, we're right back where we were with Tom Gilbert. And so we went in, and the chairman was always very supportive. The COO really didn't like me at all. He thought it was an absolute waste of time. So he would begrudgingly sitting there. And Gary started drawing these stick figures and stuff. And you could see uh, George just kind of eyes roll back. And all of a sudden, Gary rolled out the profile of the integrated organization known as Motorola. And I'll never forget, Mitchell said, I got it. It's the white spaces. He got it. Our seminar ended after 34 minutes because he got it. And then we were empowered to continue to move it through the organization. And, and because of that, we literally worked in sites all over the world. 
And I remember one, and we'll leave with this, one session as we were in uh, UK. It happened to be the week of the 4th of July. And it was at a time when people still liked Americans. And so every night when we would come back, since the sun was still up, we'd go to a pub, which is where I found debriefing with Gary to be very helpful. <laughs> and on Thursday, he said to me, we'd go, he says, Bill, do you realize we haven't had any food this week? And I said, yeah. I said, it is kind of strange, but I don't ever remember having a meal. He said, we haven't eaten at all this week because you keep taking me to these pubs. People like us, we're Americans, they buy us drink. We've celebrated the 4th of July five times. And I have to eat by Friday to wrap this sucker up. So we had breakfast. He also said something, and he said, beware of false prophets called HR people. Some of you are probably in that. But he said, they're coming in with whiz-bang tools. They're going to rank and rate you. They're going to assess you. They're going to tell you what you should be doing. But he said, but they don't understand the organization. They don't understand it. And it's very true. And uh, over time, we were able to, I think, uh, pick up on that. Uh, his contribution to me was he changed how I look at an organization. He also changed the view of the performer in the organization. And that quote of, you know, a bad system, a great performer will get the performer every time. And he also brought humor. We always had a great time. And with Gary, we always had two work days, the one you paid for and then the one I really enjoyed, which was after the clock stopped and we could really debrief and he would tell me what he really thought of us and we would do likewise. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess the final is I never knew anyone who could make so much money selling so many companies as such a poor artist. <laughs>